Duran Premium Cigars, one of the fastest growing boutique cigar companies, providing smokers a portal into the old Cuban tradition of perfect balance and the lost art of progressive flavor construction. Roberto Palayo Duran began his career in tobacco over two decades ago in Havana, where his reputation grew within Cuban circles. The creation of Duran Premium Cigars has given Roberto the platform to introduce a series of cigars that offer the same quality, construction, and detail which he perfected while in Cuba. Brands include the Ultra Premium Roberto P. Duran Premium Cigar Series, Azan Cigars, Naya, and Baracoa. Duran Cigars uses a seed to humidor approach as all tobacco is grown on their farms and rolled in their factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. Rollers have been carefully chosen to carry out Roberto's precise method to ensure the progressive flavor in each cigar. Duran Cigars invites you to make their premium your standard. Welcome back, everyone, to the Stogie Geek Show. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian, joined here in studio by Mr. Will Cooper. Hey, Paul. And we got a, a segment coming up. We've also got Kruk in the house. He came to visit, and we just put him to work. We needed someone to I was be like, a hey, host. We're too lazy, uh, and I've had too many cocktails to feel like switching sets. So I'm like, you need to fill in that third seat. And uh, so here, you got your chance, see? Yeah. Croc, thank you very much yeah, for coming down, you. and, and thank problem. you for, for um, uh, appearing on the show with us. Absolutely. Yeah. Now we're going to put show. you to work. Yeah. Not that, like, like work is like drinking and smoking cigars, so it's, uh, it's not like, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Could be worse. A uh, quick reminder, uh, CRA. This yes. is a show in support of CRA. We want 100% participation from our audience. Sign up for CRA if you're not a member. Renew if you are a member. I will – if you sign up, you'll get two free cigars. I will give you an additional cigar whether you sign up or renew. Uh, but if you want programs like this to continue as well as programs hosted by our guests, which we'll introduce in a second, uh, it's very important right now. Uh, your ambassador code is 0159. 0159. Use my ambassador code. Send an email to the show at stogiegeeks.com, and it will be a good cigar. It's not going to be crap, I promise. And our next guest – I. I feel like I know our next Me guest too. I because know. I, I've listened to his show religiously for a really long Saturday time. Saturday afternoons are just yeah. a staple, yeah. I got a chance to visit uh, Two Guys Smoke Shop uh, recently. Uh, unfortunately, Dave, uh, I happened to miss Dave while it was, it was kind of an impromptu visit. Uh, Mr. Jonathan was there, and I was just super impressed by everything these guys uh, do. The shop, the show, all of the exclusives to the store, his own brands, all the brands that he carries. Dave Garofalo, welcome to Dave, the Stoey Geek Show. Thank you, Welcome. Happy anniversary to you guys. Thank you. Ver- thank, thank you very you. much. Um, now, Dave, when do you, you broadcast your show every Saturday morning or Saturday at noon? Noon to two. Noon to two. And you do that from the Salem store, correct? We do it from wherever we can do it. Uh, the key to us is uh, we broadcast live and we have to be able to smoke. So we've done it uh, at different things like the Rocky Mountain Cigar Festival at our uh, three stores. We did it in Connecticut at the tobacco farms, whoever will have us, but the key is we have to smoke. And we uh, simulcast for many years uh, through seven radio stations, all seven which I have never visited Mm -hmm. because uh, I wouldn't use their studios because they wouldn't allow smoking. So we would have to do it on location every time. Dave, you're a huge proponent of of cigar smoking and our rights, and and we really appreciate that. And um, I know I've heard the story from a lot of different people, but... Uh, at one time, your stores were in Massachusetts, and you made the decision rather quickly to move your, all of your stores to New Hampshire. Uh, tell us about that move. I did. Um, I, uh, this was 1995, and we were 10 years in the business at the time. We had three locations in the Boston area, Somerville, Everett, uh, which is my hometown, and East Boston, Massachusetts, uh, right near the airport. And uh, Massachusetts was uh, saying they wanted to implement the tax. This is during the cigar boom of the 90s. They wanted a piece of it, so they wanted a 30% tax. I asked every retailer that was in the Boston area at the time, there were 30 of us, uh, if they would join me and fight along with me, and they refused. Uh, I was a competitor of theirs, and I said, put our competitiveness aside, and let's fight together. They all refused, so I fought alone. And I fought a losing battle. And as I was losing the battle and actually uh, got them down to 12% from the 30 that they were asking, uh, I left the State House steps and got interviewed by the Boston Globe, uh, Boston's biggest newspaper. And they said, what is your problem? 
uh, you know, trying to get a story out of it. And I said, the problem is they're going to tax cigars. And if they do, I will close all three of my stores and move over the border into New Hampshire. And uh, would you know it that I got uh, quoted on the front page above the fold of the Boston Globe. At that point, uh, my foot was in my mouth. I had no choice but to stand by my word. And wouldn't you know it, uh, on July 1st of 95, they implemented it, and it was a floor tax. They would add a tax anything that you had existing. I had built inventory over 10 years to build up into these three stores, starting very, very small. And um, the... Uh, floor tax alone was enough to kill me, so uh, I had no choice anyway, and we moved, closed the stores, moved to Salem, New Hampshire, and opened our first store, started up all over again. That was in 1995, and fast forward, we have now three stores, exit one off every major highway leaving Boston, and that's not by mistake. Mm. Those are our customers, and we told those uh, other retailers that um, are moving because my customers um, are going to go to New Hampshire, so I'm going to go there for them. And they said, uh, that's what you think is going to happen. You think your customers are going to follow you. And I said, uh, yeah, I think my customers are going to follow me, and I think your customers are going to follow me too. And they laughed at me, but uh, here it is uh, many years later. Of those 30 stores, 29 are out of business. Wow. And this wow. is because of taxation. And I don't, that's not how I want to win. I don't want to beat them. I want to beat them by customer service and marketing mm -hmm. and promotions and things like that. Uh, but I knew that was going to happen. And finally, we're starting to see an organization happen in Massachusetts. They need it bad because you have to fight. It's not, we're in a, a, a weird business that our business cannot just be about buying and selling cigars. It is legislation. Everybody's against us. I'm, I'm so proud to be on the show with you, not only your fourth anniversary, but that it, it is all about cigar rights. And that's what we need is we need our rights with the one minority that's allowed to be crapped all over. And uh, it's something's got to change. And that has to change by people getting together, whether they're competitors or not. It doesn't matter. Get together and compete after, but get together and, and try to beat it or else we're all going to die together. Yeah, and, and Dave, you've been instrumental in, uh, in saying just that and doing just that and backing up what you say and say, look, yes, we compete, but we all need to stand uh, together. And you're very much a, a cigar brother, even though uh, this is the first time we've spoken. But again, I, you know, I feel like I know you. Uh, when I stopped by your shop, I was extremely impressed with the shop in Salem, New Hampshire. Fantastic selection. Mr. Jonathan took me through the whole store. To, I toured the studio. It was, it was just an awesome experience. Uh, we bought some great cigars. Dave, I wanted to thank you. You pers sent me personally cigars from your humidor. Um, which we're smoking right now, uh, in yeah. honor of you and the great things that, that you've done for the cigar industry uh, in promoting this, this great hobby. Yeah, so. I got the well, black bomb right now. It's great. Okay. Well, my pleasure, and I would have loved to have been here. If I knew you were coming, I, I definitely would have been there. I don't miss many days. I work seven days a week, and it was so odd that uh, you came by and I wasn't here. I'm like, oh, my God, because I would have shared a cigar with you up in my office, and, and that's what I keep those type of cigars for. Uh, I call them the geek sticks and stuff. Yeah, uh, well, you give to me a, a Tatawahe M80, dude. I love this cigar. I remember when it first came out, and we were yeah. just chomping at the bit, calling every retailer, trying to get as many as we can. And uh, it's just one of those iconic sticks, I think, in my smoking history. So you hit the nail on the head, Dave. Beautiful. Glad and and Dave, you it. sold out of that cigar with like, within 24 hours, which I think was the fastest of all the Tatawahi releases. Was that an exclusive to your stores, Dave? Or It, it was. I, uh, I approached Pete many years ago with the concept of um, the firecracker-looking cigar. And uh, Pete uh, thought it was kind of gimmicky. It is kind of gimmicky. But I said, um, you know, I think it'll be good and I can market it and I can move this thing. And uh, he didn't go with it. And we went on to someone else first with that black bomb you're smoking. Good and then later on, uh, I had Papine in the early days. And I knew Papine actually before he even came to the United States when he was in Nicaragua. And he spent the day in the store actually rolling cigars early on. And I had him make me a little short, shorter than a Robusto cigar, about three and a half inches long. And then I said, put a tail on it. And then I made him put a longer tail on it and put his band on it. And uh, I asked him, uh, what do you think of this? And he said, loco. I don't, I don't know much <laughs> Spanish at all, but I know that's crazy. <laughs> and I, I gave him uh, uh, um, an offer to buy X amount of hundreds of boxes of cigars at a certain price. He agreed. And then uh, years later, Pete contacted me and said, 
I blew it. And I said, no, nah, you didn't blow it. I said, it, it is gimmicky. And he says, I'm in the factory when they're making them all the time because it was a brand that, that Papine was going to continue to make. So we'd order two, 300 boxes at a time, all the time. And um, then Pete said, maybe we can come up with something uh, like it. And the next step up was the M80. So we did a one-time release with it. And last year, uh, he said, what do you think? You want to do it one more time? And I said, I want to do it a lot of more, lots more times. Mm -hmm. So we did it again. And I think we did 500 boxes. Uh, and it was uh, less than 24 hours. They were gone. Pete still got the juice. There's no doubt about it. Mm. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great cigar. Really strong cigar, but lots of flavor. Yeah. Um, Dave, <clears throat> we've been playing this game here on the Stoey Geek Show, and I want to make sure that we get to it. Uh, and then after the, we play this little trivia game, we'll, we'll ask you more questions. But... Um, I've got 20 cigar trivia questions. Oh, now, God. we've asked these questions, Dave, of some people that you may know. All right. We've asked them um, of Mr. William Cooper, who didn't know the answers to the questions before I asked them. I came up with these questions based on my research on the Internet. And Will scored an 85, and he's currently in the lead. So there's 20 questions. Will scored an 85. Now, you may also know John Carney. From the Florida sure. Dominicana, of course, right? John's a uh, uh, New England guy. Um, he scored a 70. He's in second oh, place. No. Oh, no. Um, I'm so scared now. <laughs> tied for, sec uh, for third place, rather, is Glenn Loop from the CRA and Todd Lascola from next door at the Havana Cigar Club. These are the same questions, and how come I don't know what they are? This is the same questions. <laughs> and in last place at 45% is Dave Burke. From the Cigar Jukebox podcast. He was up at 12.30 in the morning doing this. Yeah, yeah. he wasn't at the, at the top of his game for that. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask you, um, Dave, all of these questions. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you the answers now. We're just going to give you a score. And then at the end of our show today, we're going to give out all of the answers. All right. Okay? Now, it's multiple choice. Okay? Good. Two topics. Cigar history and cigar uh, tobacco Let plants. Let me say, he's going to beat me. There's no question. He's we have high hopes for you. The bar is high, Dave. The bar is high. He's going to beat me. There's no question. I, 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 I'm gonna... I was a D student in school. <laughs> but you know cigars. <laughs> oh, my You're going to make New Hampshire proud. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You're representing New Hampshire. You're representing the cigar business, Two Guys Smoke Shop, the Cigar Authority. There's a lot riding on this, Dave. <laughs> help me. Can Crack help me on this? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, pre no pressure or anything, Dave. Oh, geez. All right. Dave, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. When did Connecticut Broadleaf first appear in the cigar market? Was it A, the 1920s, B, the 1820s, C, the 1950s, or D, the last time William Cooper had hair? I'm going to go with 1920s. The phrase close but no cigar originated from Bill Clinton's presidency, B, a cigar being a popular carnival game prize. B. All right. You're making this easy on me, Dave. You got, you got the answers. Uh, Fidel Castro got his own brand in 1966, which was called A, Monte Cristo. Cohiba. You're making this. You're too. You're, Dave. You're just, <laughs> Dave. Is this this right? Did I tell you? Did I no, tell so, you? No, this, this is good. Okay. <laughs> um, where does the term stogie come from? George Burns invented it, okay. B, Cuba, C, it's Spanish for cigar, or D, Pennsylvania manufacturers who use the term Conestoga, which means covered wagons. Covered wagons. A thousand tobacco seeds can fit inside of what? A, a pint glass. B, nestled in my glorious chest hair. C, a thimble. Or D, a 55-gallon drum. Thimble. What does the term hecho a mano mean? A, man hands, B, handmade, C, manly men, or D, Hector's man? Handmade. The Cuban embargo banning the importation of cigars and other goods from Cuba was put into effect in which year? A, 1962, B, 1961, C, 1960, or D, 1992? Say the question again. The Cuban embargo banning the importation of cigars and other goods from Cuba was put into effect in which year? 1962. You better get that one right. The first successful commercial crop in the U.S. was cultivated in 1612 in which U.S. state? A, Connecticut, B, Rhode Island, C, Virginia, or D, Pennsylvania? Mm. 
I'm going to go with uh, either Virginia or Pennsylvania. I'm going to go with Virginia. In 1994, the Cuban government created this organization to handle the global distribution and marketing of Cuban cigars. A, General Cigar, B, Cohiba, C, Habanos S.A., or D, Swedish Match. Question again? In 1994, the Cuban government created this organization to handle the global distribution and marketing of Cuban cigars. Habanos. In what year did Davidoff cease production of cigars in Cuba? A, 1961, B, 1966, C, 1989, or D, 1991? Uh, 89 and 91. I'm going to go with 91. Okay. Now we're on to the tobacco plant questions. Cigar tobacco plants require how many hours of sunlight per day? A, 4, B, 6, C, 8, or D10? They require so many hours of sunlight. This question stumped a lot of people, dude. This is yeah. one of the two times. Well, it's, it's going to get what it's going to get, but so they, they're going to do it during the season that has the most sunlight, so I'll go with 10. The lowest priming of a tobacco leaf, uh, tobacco plant, rather, I'm sorry, is called what? A, Lajero, B, Viso, C, Seco, or D, Velado? Velado, lowest. A cured tobacco leaf is brown because what has been replaced by carotene? A, chlorophyll, B, cholesterol, C, caloric acid, or D, pigment? A. What is the country of origin of the Cameroon wrapper? A, Nicaragua. Africa. A, Nicaragua, B, Indonesia, C, Cameroon, or D, Ecuador? Cameroon. To create a Maduro wrapper, you need what? A, a Maduro seed plant. B, to use the right fermentation process. C, a Maduro priming. Or D, black paint. Well, two (laughs) answers to that, but I'll take uh, B. (laughs) What is the top most priming of a tobacco plant? A, Corona, B, Lajero, C, Viso, or D, Velado? It is Corona. This type of plant was developed in the 1930s by Diego Rodriguez, named after its birthplace in the Vuelta Abuejo, Abuejo. Abuejo region. I can't get that right. It was the premier wrapper for Cuban cigars until the 1990s. Is it A, Habano, B, Criollo, C, Corojo, or D, Piloto Cubano? Corojo. Primarily used for filler, this Dominican tobacco plant derives part of its name from the Spanish word for aroma. Is it A, Piloto Cubano, B, Olor Dominicano, C, San Vicente, or D, Chibao Valley? What's the question again? Primarily used for filler, this Dominican tobacco plant derives part of its name from the Spanish word for aroma. Say the uh, answers again? Yep. Piloto Cubano, Olor Dominicano, San Vicente, or Chibao Valley? I'll take A. Picked or primed tobacco leaves are hung in barns, also known as Casas de Tabac, for approximately how many days before moving on to the next stage? Is it A, 30 days, B, 7 days, C, 50 days, or D, 60 days? 60. In the first phase of fermentation, leaves are bunched together in gavilas, or bunches of five or more leaves, then laid in short piles around one to three feet tall, which are called A, burrows. B, pilones, C, piles, or D, mounds? Pilones. All righty. That is the 20 questions. Now I need a spectacular drum roll. For it was a major score he got. Our 80, 80, 80, 85. Last it, contestant Dave, you did very here well. Got an 80. Yeah. Wow, 80. it's great. 80. I know what I got wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that count? 80's good for me. It's, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, very I'm, good. You got, hey. you got the hardest questions right. There was one question that everyone stumbled on, 
Everyone. And no, there is there is one question that everyone got wrong. Do you want, well, you know what? I'll give the answer to that one because yeah. everyone got, oh, it, got wrong. it wrong. Oh, he got it wrong too? Everyone got okay. it wrong. Uh, cigar tobacco plants require how many hours of sunlight per day? The answer is eight hours. That's Tobacconist University yeah. said that. Yeah, so. came from Tobacconist. You know and I, I never took the Tobacconist University test because I hate taking tests. I'm scared <laughs> I'm going to do bad. Me it's too, like, Dave. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, I'm sure. right there with you. I'm horrible at tests, right? I always got the written portion. Like, if it was a written test, I, I did well. If it was, like, a multiple choice or true false, like, kind of exam, I do terrible We had, him like, tests. Rodney Dangerfield and back to school, I mean. <laughs> yeah. The- but I'll, I'll remember the answer to that because there's, like, eight hours in a work day, and you yeah. just think of it as plants yeah, put yeah. in, like, eight hours, right? Yeah. Eight hours in the work day. Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't. I never knew how many hours. Was, they get as many hours as they can get. That was my thinking on it, too, originally. Yeah. They're going to uh, – it. it's a cloudy day. It's a cloudy day. That's it. they got to deal with it. It's not going to be optimum, but I would imagine if they could get 10 hours in a day, they would take it. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a lot of fun. It's something new we've been doing here in the show. Uh, Dave, you carry a lot of fabulous cigars in your store, and we've been smoking through a lot of them on the show. We – um, probably every other show we talk about a cigar that's either exclusive to you or one of the cigars that you make. Um, you make uh, your namesake cigar, the Garofalo cigar, which I smoked in the torpedo size, which yeah. is an excellent, um, mild bodied cigar, uh, lots of flavor. Uh, tell us how you, you, you came to, to create a, you know, that kind of mild cigar, which it can be really hit or miss in the market, as I'm sure you're very aware of. Well, that, that is my, uh, to my liking anyway, uh, that I like milder cigars. I can smoke anything, but if, if I have to choose something, I'm going to go on the milder end of it uh, to, to enjoy something. By the way, I'm smoking today a uh, Davidoff anniversary number three, and that's only because they don't have an anniversary number four. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, would, I would have smoked it, but uh, it was the best I could do. Uh, we appreciate but, it. Uh, yeah. Thank you. But um, it was uh, on my 50th birthday five years ago. Um, that Nick Perdomo came in to visit me and he brought me a box of cigars and it was all gift wrapped and I opened it up and it was a box of with a big G in the front of it and I opened it up and it's Garofalo cigars and I said you made a uh, cigar for me and he said no I actually made a line of cigars (laughs) (laughs) and uh, you know if you would allow me to do it I'd like to uh, name it after you and I want to put the cigar out and I said oh geez I don't know Um, you know Why would you do that? And he said, um, you know, you did a lot for the cigar world, blah, blah, blah. Said all nice things to me. And, um, you know, I said, well, I'm going to be your biggest customer on it no matter what anyway. But let's try it. Let's see how it smokes. And he says, I blended it to your palate because um, Nick made heavier Nicaraguan cigars. That's his palate. And um, it was actually the champagne um, that came out that was me begging him to actually come out with, with that cigar that he would stand in our store and Nick has been uh, a supplier of ours since the day he started in business. He tells me he still has some triplicate forms handwritten when I would place orders with him when he was operating out of his garage. I'm, I'm a big proponent to try to help the new guy getting in because it is the future of our business is to help the small company survive so that new companies can go. Just giving all, uh, as a buyer, as a uh, retailer, just taking care of the big brands that kind of pull themselves out of the store. They're big enough names that it's going to actually pull out with no effort at all. Uh, We're going to go through the extra effort to try to push uh, some new guy's brand out. Therefore, um, more people will get in the business and it will thrive and survive. Rising tides raise all ships, so let's help the little guy. So he remembers that, and he, uh, nice, nice man that he, that he did this for me. Uh, I don't think it's ever been done besides Zeno Davidoff himself that um, had a cigar brand named after him, and it was an honor for him to do that, and um, it happens to be that I like the cigar. It's, it's a, um, a shade wrapper, but it's Nicaraguan uh, filler and binder, but lower primings, as we talked about, uh, mm-hmm. that uh, not a lot of the hero is like a quarter leaf in the center of it. Uh, as I, I've di- disassembled a cigar, we, we do cigar schools and teach people about tobacco and show them that, you know, the percentage of everything that goes in and why. And it's something everybody can enjoy. And if you have a good enough palate, and I know you're talking to people uh, on the air at all times, and it tends to be that the um, 
geek, for lack of a better word, the guy that's really into cigars, is always wants full-bodied. I urge them to try to get into milder cigars to taste the nuances that they, they can taste. Because when you get into the fuller-bodied cigars, a lot of it is overpowering the mild uh, complexity that, that happens in cigars. So uh, that, that's the idea of it. That's what I like about it. And uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, him just being nice to me. It, you know, that, it that's certainly a... wasn't me being vain enough to put my name on a cigar. Well, it's interesting, Dave, that you say, uh, it caught my attention, you said you like to smoke milder cigars, because I'm in that category as well. I smoke a lot of Connecticut's, a lot of cigars that are mild to medium, uh, and I really like that strength profile. What are some of your most favorite cigars in the mild category that you like to smoke in the morning with coffee? Uh, I'm a big fan of Avo. He's been a friend for many, many mm. years. We celebrated a lot of birthdays together. Um, I, um, I'm a fan of Davidoff. Um, the Atabe cigar, which is Nelson Alfonso's, uh, I fell in love with that cigar the first time I tried it and later got the distribution to it. Uh, and so are you I- an exclusive to the Atabe and Byron? I am now. I wasn't at the beginning. Mm-hmm. We were the, the highest volume retailer of it in a short period of time because I believed in it and uh, got behind it. And then the man that was the distributor in California uh, understood the circumstances Nelson Alfonso was in, that Nelson someday hopes to take the distribution back when he's able to come to the United States. Um, you know, this is a, a, a Cuban um, uh, man that um, lives in Cuba, uh, along with uh, passports from Spain also, but he, he is a Cuban. And um, someday he hopes to end up having the distribution. Right now, I consider myself a placeholder for him. I'm not a distributor, but but I am distributing his cigars. Mm-hmm. I told him he could go certainly elsewhere and get somebody that would hit the road and have salespeople and really be able to market it. Uh, I'm acting as a placeholder right now, and I hope that uh, real fast – he can uh, come to the United States, start his uh, company, bring his family with him, and uh, go off on his own, and I'll be his biggest customer and biggest supporter. But right now, I'm, I act as a placeholder, basically. And, and those cigars are really amazing. I mean, they're high uh, price tag cigars, but in my opinion, it's worth every penny. Absolutely. Will and I have rated those cigars super, super yeah. high uh, every time we smoke them. You yep. were kind enough to give to some, which I had never heard about them before. Very thankful for you for, for doing that. Not just for the gift, but for turning me on to this yeah, brand, which is brand. really, really awesome. So well, what are some of the blends that he's using? Uh, he won't divulge it to anybody, mm-hmm. uh, not even not even me. He makes them in Costa Rica. He, um, he doesn't use any Costa Rican tobacco. He lets me know of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, other than that, uh, he doesn't say anything about it. it. It's a very unique cigar in the in the respects that if you look in the foot of the cigar, and nobody really does before they light a cigar, you'll notice that the color of the wrapper, filler, and binder are all color sorted to match. Uh, it's for a total balance. The work that he puts into it is incredible. Um, he does a thing with five different cedars with a tobacco uh ages inside these cedar rooms with five different tobaccos. He uses no fermentation. The fermentation is certain kinds of cedar that would kill, would act as a fermentation to it. And he makes the cigars and ages them for many years after that by lowering the humidity down and then bringing the humidity up very, very slowly over months and back down and back up. And what he's doing is actually having the cigar breathe. So the cigar Hmm. goes down in humidity, up in humidity. Over years, back and forth, back and forth. It's actually like breathing in the the, um, different types of cedar in it. So if you notice, again, this is not a full-bodied cigar when it comes to the Atabay. You go to Byron, you got a lot more strength there. But on the Atabay, you're going to taste even different cedars. You're talking Brazilian cedars and different things that he does. This guy is a remarkable guy. Uh, It was another manufacturer who... um, I'll, I'll leave them nameless, but um, somebody that you wouldn't expect would drive somebody to some other cigar company. And he said, you of all people have to see this to appreciate it. Go look at it. Go try it. I did. I fell in love with it. And I've uh, unfortunately been chain smoking these things ever since. <laughs> My first order, I remember saying to him that I don't know if I'm going to be able to sell a 20 to $30 cigar in New Hampshire, of all places. This is in uh, Madison Ave, New York. This is New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. But if nobody buys them, I'll smoke them myself. And uh, knock on wood, we've sold a ton of them. I mean, it's a big, big part of our business. And that's because there's not a lot of retailers that have them. It's available to them if they want it. 
they can give me a call and I can set them up for it and they can do it. But it requires a good sales staff to be able to sell it, tell the story, show the cigar, mm -hmm. get somebody to try it. Once they try it, that's it. Let the cigar work on its own. But it's not like a brand like Davidoff that is known worldwide or anything. This is a one-man operation um, and in a unique way that he makes the cigars in Costa Rica. He goes to Costa Rica, shuts the factory down for two weeks, twice a year, brings his tobacco in, has those rollers assemble and make the cigars while he watches every single cigar being produced, and then shuts the factory back down. They bring their regular stuff back in and start their production. Uh, he does it twice a year, fills up on the second time of depending on what uh, is done, but he demands to oversee every cigar that's made. When you look at it, when you see the wrapper, when you see the construction of it, how perfect every single cigar is, you can see it and appreciate and understand why it is at that point what it is. Not only is it beautiful, and the people from Cigar Aficionado uh, got a hold of it, and they, they wrote a little something on it um, that usually um, packaging doesn't... Um, live up to the cigar itself. In this case, Nelson tells me he's actually sorry he made the packaging so beautiful because it kind of takes away from the cigar itself. He wants people talking about the cigar that he's proud of, mm -hmm. not the beautiful work that he put into the designing. Because as far as designing goes, he's the one that designs all the Cuban products that are out there since 1999. Uh, he's in, 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 introduced Cohiba Bihike. Uh, that was his design and development and whole thought process that went into that, along with Vigorosos, uh, everything that comes out since 1999. You look at the bottom of a limited release Cuban product, you're going to either see Byron written on the bottom of it, which was his trademark until he put the Byron brand back out. Once he did that, they said, you know, we really shouldn't put Byron on the bottom of Cohiba because it's like putting Romeo and Juliet on the bottom of Cohiba. It's confusing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so now it says Habanos by Nelson Alfonso making him the only living person besides Fidel Castro to have his name on a Cuban product. Hmm. This guy's really special. And when, you, when I go to the trade show with him, uh, it's not the retailer that's coming over there and, and uh, hmm. talking to him. It's the manufacturers around the world that come over and basically come by and kiss the ring. I mean, this hmm. guy is the real deal. And um, unfortunately, he's not known so much in the United States, but everywhere else in the world, uh, they know who he is. The Padron 50th anniversary that came out, he developed and designed that for them. There's lots of things. While I'm with him, you, I, I see everybody looking to collaborate with him, uh, including um, Hanky Kellner that would love to uh, do a blend along with him. And I begged them to do it. Mm. I said, this would be great. It, it will help your brand grow mm. if, you, if you connect to these people. Padron wants to work with them and did. Uh, all these people wanting to do it, but he's in a sticky situation. Uh, you have to understand Cuba for what it is and, and how it operates. It's not a country like ours. We were lucky enough to be born here, and we have the um, um, the, the uh, openness to be able to speak and say what we want. They don't. So um, he's operating with two hands tied behind his back. I got a gag in my mouth, and, and, and at the same time, we're trying to sell this thing. I said, it's very, very hard. You make it mm. very difficult to, uh, you know, um, promote it and um, market it and everything. And I, I love marketing and promotion, but uh, you're giving me nothing. And the little bit that I know uh, is a wink, and uh, don't say anything about this. So he'll tell me something <laughs> and then say, don't say anything about it. Well, Okay. Now, no. now, Dave, <laughs> speaking of Cuba, I, I, I do have to ask you about your views on Cuban cigars. Uh, I can't say that I agreed 100% with everything that you said, but having said that, you did visit the country, you smoked the cigars, and you came back and you, you gave your opinion. And whether you agree or not, you have to respect that you did travel to the country and, and give your honest opinion um, about those cigars. And you received a lot of feedback yeah. about those segments yeah. that you ran on the show. You're already <laughs> laughing, you know, about that. But, yeah. um, you know, kind of talk about your experiences in Cuba and some of the feedback that you've uh, received. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted to wait till I could legally go. And I'm one of the first people that ever got my passport stamped with Cuba on it. I wouldn't go unless I, I would do it. I wasn't going to put the piece of paper in the middle of it. I wasn't going to go from another country and sneak my right. way in. I wanted to be invited in there. And I wanted to uh, basically be able to really see what's going to go on. And they were so nice uh, to let me do. I don't know if they'll ever let me do it again. But uh, <laughs> they let me see everything. They gave me a, a, a free-for-all reign of that. And... Uh, um, I, I 
took notes as I went on and I took pitches and I, and I put everything down. I, I did nothing but cigars. I mean, that was my thing. Uh, I just didn't visit the country. I, I, I missed a lot of the country. I, uh, went there for cigars. So I visited every factory that would let me in, which was most of them. I went to all the tobacco fields that would, would let me, uh, go see. I talked with all the people and, uh, I got all the information I could possibly get. Um, and I discussed it on the uh, Cigar Authority show. And after that, I got lots of people actually requesting, did I put this in writing? Well, I actually had it in writing because I, I wrote notes for myself to be able to talk about it. And then I said, you know what? Uh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to put it out there. So I ended up putting it out there. Dave's trip to Cuba. You ever want to Google something? <laughs> um, and it, it all builds to the final conclusion of what it is. And this is when, when the crap hit the fan. Um, that there's people that love Cuban cigars and listen, you love them, you love them. But the facts are the facts of what I saw and what it is. I, I know what I'm talking about when it comes to tobacco and I know what I'm talking, even though I only got an 80 on your test, <laughs> I, I know what I'm talking about and I know what I saw and there's no denying it, even from them, because I did have a long conversation, uh, which was supposedly be supposedly going to be a 15 minute conversation with uh, top people at Habanos after that came out that they wanted to talk to me. Um, and um, it ended up being two and a half hours. I was offered a position uh, with them hmm. and I refused it. Um, and I would, I said, I'll be happy to help you along the way. They don't understand the U S market. They, um, think that it's okay to have a cigar that ha has drawing problems, burning mm -hmm. problems, a cigar that needs aging when it goes to the consumer. I'm a retailer in the United States, uh, and nothing wrong with taking a cigar and aging it, but to actually mm -hmm. buy it and you better sit on the cigar for a year or so. Uh, and then it's going to burn properly will not be accepted in my store. I mean, my customers mm -hmm. aren't going to accept that. Uh, I'll sell them a, a five or six dollar cigar, and if it's if it's not going well, they want a new one, a replacement for it, and we give it to them. Um, that will not be the case uh, with Cuban cigars because we'll all go broke if they remain the same. Mm -hmm. And what I, the you know, I don't I don't mean to hurt anybody when I say this. I I mean to help them. I want them to hear what their problems are, and I want them to fix it before it comes here because I will be the biggest buyer of Cuban cigars when it happens. I'm not going to be oh he worries about the cigars that he carries. I am looking forward to the day the embargo lifts. I'm looking forward to being the biggest seller of Cuban cigars in the United States or maybe in the world if possible and get behind it. But the way it was there, and I'm talking from the tobacco end, fertilizer, all the way through the production of it, uh, the aging process, everything that was wrong, and I listed everything that was there, um, it, it was bad. And I've seen it all. I've been to everybody's tobacco uh, fields and everybody's tobacco uh, production facilities, aging processes. Um, I I haven't been to Hawaii ever, but I've been to every one of these um, bad places. I, I spent way too much time in Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, Mexico, uh, than I care to even talk about, but it's part of my business. Um, they're not, they're doing it the old Cuban way because they don't have the infrastructure in the information or the tools to do it the way it has been brought up since 1958. Now but Dave, things, I, I think yeah. some of the perception was that um, people thought you were saying like all Cuban cigars are bad, but I don't think that's what you were I'm saying. I'm not saying right? they're bad. I'm, I'm saying they're all the same. <laughs> yeah. They're actually all the same. Uh, the bind of filler wrapper, we, we're talking about the different levels of tobacco that there is. So the low primings of tobacco are used for combustion. That's what's going to help the tobacco burn. Every cigar needs it or else it's not going to burn well. Mm -hmm. And you're, gonna, you're talking about aroma, uh, is going to be the middle part of the plant. It's going to give it a good aroma to it. And then the higher part of the plant is going to give it some strength. As they make a cigar, they're using one seed grown in basically one area of Cuba. And people will say there's other, there's other small little plantations, but you take Pinal del Rio, there's 100 tobacco farms in Pinal del Rio. Almost all of it is grown there. Mm -hmm. Everybody's growing the same seed in the same type of area, and they're breaking it up into in, into uh, polones and then into bales of um, the three primings. That's it. They break it into three, and they put the year on it, and that's it. Now they start making cigars, and it's equal parts. One-third of each pot makes up a cigar. Then it becomes a whatever brand it's going to be, and mm -hmm. that's based on color sorting. 
So we, we look at, and we talk about blending all the time, that somebody uses San Vicente in for a binder, and they use in Mexican for this. Not in Cuba. In Cuba, it is a puro. It's, it's pure Cuban tobacco, fill a wrapper binder, and it's certain parts of each thing, and they make it into a cigar. If you like Cuban cigars, it's great because no matter what brand you're going to smoke, it's going to be very, very similar to every other one because it's actually the same ingredients of it. Is the roller going to make a difference? Slightly, that the person's going to make a tight drawer or whatever they're going to do. Uh, is the um, wrapper color uh, on the outside wrapper color going to change? Slightly. Therefore, they're going to color sort at that point, and they're going to have the darker tobaccos be Cohiba, the lighter tobaccos be Ahoya de Monterey, it, but it's the same cigar. Mm. And Dave. I know because I watched it over and over and over. So, Dave, I got I to gotta kind of add on to this story, and Paul doesn't even know I had this conversation with someone. So I, I heard the story. I was a little skeptical. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm like, really? You know, but I didn't, I didn't know the answer. I was at a uh, cigar event with a, I would say, a pretty significant manufacturer who I don't believe you have a relationship with based on who I see coming in out of the Cigar Authority. And he brought a Cuban roller with him. And there was some discussion going on. And I don't think this Cuban roller listens to the Cigar Authority. I'm going to be totally <laughs> honest with you. I'm sure. But he said everything you said about what you just said about how those things are sorted out. Absolutely. He, and Absolutely. that kind of – and, I, and I, then I talked to this manufacturer who I very much trust. And I don't want to reveal it because I don't want to open Pandora's box. But he corroborated this. So there's more than one person who said this is all I'm going to say. Yeah. So I, I kind of changed a little. Hearing it validated a little more. I didn't agree with the part with you on the master blender because I don't think a master blender is going to be around for blends who are doing blends for 30 or 40 years that are out there. But I, I could see to some extent that you didn't see a blender that could raise a flag too. So I kind of get that. Yeah. Now, if they're making a new limited release that they're making, sure, somebody ends up having to put that cigar yeah. together and say whatever it is. Short of that, and, and um, you know, I, I smoked 50 cigars in six days. People will say, uh, you know, you, you never even tasted cigars. I smoked 50 cigars in six days every <laughs> every. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree with that, yeah, yeah. Dave. No, Dave, you must have smoked things that you liked. There must have been some things that you liked about smoking 50 cigars in six days. You know, uh, what it came down to is, uh, at the end of it, that I, uh, was there something different to the Cohiba Bihike than there was to the others? Yes, there was. There was something different that mm -hmm. happened with that cigar. It was different. But when I took anything else, I smoked the lowest end Hoya de Monterey, um, number four, I believe it was, the Robusto. And I smoked the Cohiba Robusto, one in one hand, one in the other. And there were people there uh, watching me go through this process. Um, uh, a, a cigar manufacturer who was with me, a cigar uh, writer who was with me. And uh, because I, I had, at that point, smoked enough cigars and went through enough and saw enough that I said, I believe these two cigars are the same. And I went back to back to back smoking it. And I said, we have the same cigar. One's $8, one's $20. Uh, I choose the $8 one. Mm -hmm. I'm a retailer. I want to sell $20 cigars. So don't look at it and say, right. I'm saying it to negative. I'd rather sell, of course, more expensive cigars when it happens. But as a consumer, I would buy the lower price one, realizing it's the same exact product that it was. Well, I think that's a fair assessment, and, and you're certainly speaking from experience, which I totally respect. That you know, I'm very much a, a geek and a scientist, and I, I think that's an absolute fair assessment. Dave, I want to also ask you: We smoked a Cohiba Maduro. Do you think the Maduro process that they go through to get that darker wrapper on the Genio Secretos and the Cohiba? Do you think that's a little different? It's got to be, and, and that I didn't see. I didn't see any Maduros. I asked. There was mm -hmm. nothing there. They're making uh, cigars. You know, uh, I went into the tasting rooms with the tasters, and I, I uh, played part in it where I filled out a torpedo information on a torpedo I was smoking. They asked me uh, um, to let me know how it burned and how the combustion was and, and different things that I had. Mm -hmm. Nowhere on it was taste. So I said, hmm. how about taste? This is a tasting panel. No, no, we don't, we're not worrying about taste. We're tasting. We're trying for combustion. We're trying for burn. Okay. So I, I held it up, and I said, Monte Cristo number two? And they said, we don't know yet. Very interesting, some of the things that are said. We don't know yet. 
So now at that point, I have to investigate after and I look around and a Monte Cristo number two in a Vegas Robania torpedo is the same exact size, same packaging, same boxes, bands and everything in the same place. And they were making decisions at that point. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, I'm saying this and as I'm talking about it, I'm like, you know, do I even want to start this up again? Because I was so happy when it calmed down. <laughs> we, we got literally thousands of people calling me names. And, and like, I, I had some sort of thing like um, I have an agenda um, so that people didn't buy Cuban cigars. Listen, buy Cuban cigars, do whatever you want to do. Buy them from me when I get them. But uh, <laughs> there's no, there is no agenda. I, I was asked to um, give my information, my findings, uh, since then, uh, just like uh, Coop was saying, I heard from a lot of manufacturers who lived there and was in the cigar industry, um, older guys that were in there way back when, and they said, absolutely, that was the way it is. And why things changed, actually, the Cuban embargo made cigars better because they left Cuba and then they started their production. And what they tried to do is cre recreate the taste of Cuban cigars. In order to do that, they started blending different tobaccos together to try to emulate the taste that they had left. And by that, they said, oh, this is pretty good, but this is an Ind Indonesian binder with a, uh, you know, Connecticut wrapper with a Nicaraguan filler and Dominican uh, uh, fillers also. And this is pretty good. And then they started making blends because everybody was making all Cuban cigars, all Cuban tobacco. That's where the bulk of everything was coming. And then they ended up having the world of cigars. So in one aspect, I thank the embargo for happening, and they should too, because now there's a world of tobacco for us. Right. Um, when I was a kid, there was um, Coors Beer. You couldn't get Coors Beer. Um, I was uh, old enough that I would take a ride down west of the Mississippi, buy a bunch of Coors Beer, bring it home, put it in my refrigerator. I was the cool guy and you come to my house and I got Coors beer and it was the greatest beer of all until we could get it. And then once we could get it, we realized that Coors beer sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it always did. You know, I don't want to say that Yingling sucks, right? Yeah. I don't want to say that, but really you know, good. Dave, you're from the Northeast as, as are we, we're not that far from each other. It's a couple right. hours uh, drive, right? I'm, and I'm sorry. I'm not there with you. We're having an event here today and I'm, yeah, I'm, no, and I, I want to talk about that too. Yeah. Um, but Yingling for the longest time, you couldn't get here in New England. Nope. It was a and beer. we used to exactly what Dave is saying. We used to sneak it over like someone would go to Pennsylvania or New York and they would come back with a, you know, with a couple of uh, 12 packs or a couple of cases. It would be like, Oh, this is the best beer. Then we got it here in New England. They finally started distributing here, and we're like, "Yeah, this is good." And now we're like, "Yeah, it's, it's good." Yeah. It's no, it's not. It's not like a big deal because we can get it here now. Now it's yeah. not bad beer by any stretch of the imagination, but there's so many choices with beer now. It's just one of those other choices right. that you may reach to every once in a while, but it doesn't have that appeal because we can get it. And that's yeah. exactly what you're saying, Dave. Yeah. It's the same yeah. thing with Coors beer back in the day. Yeah. It's the same thing with Cuban cigars. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I, I like smoking Cuban cigars. I, I have some that I like better than others. Um, I think the Maduro wrapper um, on the Cohibas is a little different because it goes through the Maduro fermentation process. So I, I do think that's a little different. Um, but, you know, I hear what you're saying, and I think it's a fair assessment. And it's speaking from someone who has experienced it, which I think is important, right. certainly. But now, Dave, you're doing a, a, a big sale. And I love, I love the retail shops, um, and I love when they do sales. Because I like to see what they're going to put on sale, what they're going to bring out, what's been sitting, right? Every retailer has something that in their region, it's not saying it's a bad cigar, but in their region, it just hasn't been selling well. So they're going to mark it down to move the inventory. And I love it because it competes with the online and creates that, you know, even playing field. So right. Dave, what, what, what kind of stuff are you putting on sale? Uh, I don't like to say what they are because I don't ever want to hurt one of the manufacturers. Yeah, no, understood. Uh, and when we do, we do a sale once a year called March Madness, the first Friday of March every year. And it's usually the only time a year that we, we do such a thing. And we try to rip it off like a Band-Aid. It's at one of our stores, the Salem store that uh, mm -hmm. you were at. And uh, all the customers come there and, and people I haven't seen all year that would come at that time. And we do, you know, probably what a, a regular store would do in a year, we do in a day. Uh, lines of people at, at different registers. Um, and it, it's almost like that day is like going to a wake because uh, we're actually killing the brand at that point. Mm -hmm. and, and all the manufacturers reps usually show up early in the morning 
and they come in with their head down looking to see if any of their stuff is on the on the chopping block basically <laughs> and it's because it actually didn't sell for one reason or another and it doesn't make it bad cigars at all right right uh you know some of these cigars i'm just shaking my head and i go you know uh, there's no marketing behind it there's no uh pizzazz or something was missing but uh, we keep track of everything. We skew every single item, and we have for 25 years. Before there was barcodes on cigars, wow. we apply them ourselves. How many different facings do you have today, Dave? 1,100 open boxes at each store. Wow. Uh, well, we'll find something, yeah. Yeah, we, we do a lot, a lot of cigars. So when something hits the bottom end and you, you see you've only sold a couple of boxes an entire year and sometimes mm-hmm. even less, it's time for it to go, and we got to turn it into cash so we can buy new products. And right. we actually want to free up some space because people want the new products. Yeah. So in order to, to continue to take new products, something has to go. So today's thing is because only because it's our 30th anniversary, we said we'll put products out uh, at 30 percent off, and, and some even more than that. But um, on selected items, it's not everything in the store mm-hmm. by any means. Um, and I, I don't want to say what they are because some store might be doing well with them, or some. May Manufacturers. Right. I never want to hurt the manufacturer at all. We could certainly put it online and blow it out and not even affect our, our retail sales that happen, but that's not what it's about either. So mm. let it be gone. Nobody knows it even happened. Uh, it came and went, and nobody gets hurt because that's it. There's no, no reason to hurt anybody. I just want it to go away and maybe give that same guy that we had his cigar go away, give him another shot. You know, what's a better seller for you? Let, let me try something else. We are typically the people that decide what we're going to uh, purchase in the store. So we'll uh, taste cigars. And, and I always say to the customers, um, we taste uh, terrible cigars so you don't have to. <laughs> Things that we actually turn down. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to get into our stores, of course. And um, we, there's not room for everybody, so we try to pick the best of that price category, that strength category, that um, ring gauge category or whatever, and bring some stuff in. We don't get it right all the time. So sometimes it's actually us that we thought it looked good. This looks like it's a winner. It's a failure. Yeah, and and you realize, David, and we talk to a lot of retailers, right, and we're friends with a lot of retailers, that a lot of times the cigar that you like as the owner of the retail store is not the same cigar that your customers are going to (laughs) like. Absolutely. If if I did, there'd there'd only be one case of cigars in my store. These are my favorite cigars. Everybody just buy them. There's 1,100 of them, and more than 50% of them uh, I don't care for. They're they're way over my strength level, or uh, the ring gauge is too big or too small Mm -hmm. or whatever it is. It's not to my liking, but uh, and I'm not right. Mm. It's whatever you like is what you like. And back to the Cuban thing. If that's what you like, Cuban cigars as they are, continue to smoke them, enjoy mm-hmm. them. I'm glad you like them. I'm not saying I don't like them. They are what they are, but there's so much more they can, and I promise you will do. Mm-hmm. They heard what I said. They listened to me. They offered me a job. I mean, they, they want to make things better, and, and sometimes it actually hurts to hear it. But you need to hear that you're not doing things right so that you end up making it better, right? So Now, Dave, as, as a retailer, I want to ask you this question about which cigars you've smoked recently that you like. And I realize that could be, you know, kind of playing favoritism to a particular retailer. But in all seriousness, like what, what cigars have you smoked recently that you really, really like? All right. So uh, <coughs> one, of, one of the things that's, that's blowing my mind, and go back a couple of years ago when Davidoff made the Davidoff Nicaraguan mm-hmm. um, I loved it. I loved it because it was not uh, a Nicaraguan cigar like any other Nicaraguan. This was Davidoff making Nicaraguan, a whole different thing. And it wasn't a copy of anybody's. It wasn't like it. it um, my job a lot of times is to tell the consumer, um, he likes this, so what should I smoke? Well, I like that. Um, when you come to something like that, it's it's unique to it because it, there is no – if somebody likes Davidoff Nicaraguan, where are you going to take them? There's really no place to take them at that point. It lives on its own. So um, they came out with Avo Synchro this year. Yeah. And these guys are hitting it, man, one after the other after What's the your other. favorite size in the Avo Synchro? Uh, you know um, – I'm not a big ring gauge guy, but the big ring gauge on a box press is actually pretty good. Dave, uh, we agree yeah. with you 150%. Yeah, we were. We were. <laughs> it was the best size in the line. Yeah. And we're, again, we're not big ring gauge smokers, but that cigar was off the charts. What, yeah, what they were it, trying it, to do with that blend, the, the balance, that was the one that I thought they got the balance of the Nicaraguan and the Dominican. Mm-hmm. I didn't think the others did it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
no, th there's something to it. Um, you know, some some cigars. Um, you go to the big ring gauge cigar, it, it, it has no luster to it. I mean, it, it's almost uh, washed away. The flavor's washed away. Not in that particular case. I don't know if the box pressing had to do with it. Uh, typically, I'm appalled by big, big ring gauge cigars, to be honest with you. We carry a lot of them because mm -hmm. we sell a lot of them, and it's part of our business. Um, you know, I, I, I joke with the guys from Asylum all the, all the time, and I, I've smoked their cigar once, and it's a big seller for us. But uh, I said, I don't have to smoke it, right? And they say, no, you don't have to smoke it, but <laughs> they sell. You know, right, and that's right. part of it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, it, it, I had it that one time that I tried it, and I, I'm just uncomfortable uh, with the cigar in my mouth. Now, you box press it, it didn't seem so bad. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, I, I completely I agree. agree. <clears throat> so, Dave, um, we're going to wrap this interview up, but where are your stores? Tell our listeners where they can go to your retail stores. I mean, you have a website where you can buy cigars, but I want to encourage our listeners, if you're in the New Hampshire area, you're in the New England area, Please go visit one of Dave's stores. Where can they find your stores? Okay, so uh, we are at exit one off every major highway coming out of Boston. So if you come up Route 93, exit one off 93, Two Guys Smoke Shop. If you're going up Route 3, it's exit one off Route 3. That's Nashua, New Hampshire. And exit one off Route 95, and that is in Seabrook, New Hampshire. And we did that because, um, you know, we talked earlier about um, I was a Boston store and I left for political reasons. Um, I did a unique thing that I'm, I'm – a New Hampshire location, but I've actually never advertised or promoted myself in the state that we're in. And I'm here 20 years now, and um, we don't advertise and promote ourselves in the state. We have great retailers in the state, and we're all friends, and we get together once a month, and we have our own uh, cigar association, and we're unlike we were in Massachusetts. I know. We didn't so, talk about United Cigar. We're going to have to bring you back to, to talk about yeah, that. Yeah. But we work together, and um, I... I want my Boston customer, that was the idea of it, and I drive them up here. And they'll all say to you, they'll tell you our competitors that are up here, that um, as I drive people up and you get a guy that's into cigars, they come up because we promoted and advertised ourselves and brought you up here. And then because you're so close, you go visit our other friends that are a little north of us and go visit their stores and buy some of the cigars we don't carry, that they do. Mm -hmm. And it works out very, very well to us. Um, we, we are, uh, you know, I, I recently moved to Salem, New Hampshire, but uh, for years I went back back and forth and decided that Massachusetts ain't going to change it. So um, I'm going to, I might as well not even give them the state income tax and uh, <laughs> uh, leave all the money that, that's up here. And unfortunately, but look at a major, major metropolitan city like Boston that barely has any cigar shops, any cigar lounges. There's no place mm -hmm. to, to smoke a cigar. Edgar Cullman, who was the owner of general cigar came up uh, and I was friendly with Edgar. He used to come up and see me once a year and we'd go to dinner. Um, he was my, my best billionaire friend. And um, he, he begged me. He said he would fund me if I would open a store again in Massachusetts because there was no place in the Boston area to actually buy a Macanudo, which is, <laughs> was his pride and joy. And I said, not until they end up uh, lowering the tax or putting a, a cap like you guys did yep. in Rhode Island. And you guys did it as a test. And obviously a successful test because they kept that 50 cent cap. And now we have lots of thriving Rhode Island cigar stores that can thrive because oh, yeah. of that 50 cent cap. And I, I urge Massachusetts to get together and choose one thing to fight. You know, there's a lot of things to fight about. You want your, your smoking age not to go to 21, and you want to be able to smoke in parks and out on the beaches. And there's a million things to go, but you got to concentrate on one thing at a time, I'll tell you. And the first thing is get a 50 cent cap. At a 50 cent cap, I'd be interested in opening Boston again and putting a big store with a big lounge and really do it up. But I need something 40% tax with a six and a quarter percent um, sales tax mm -hmm. compounded on top of the compounded federal taxes that are putting up on there. Triple taxation. We threw, we threw um, tea in the water for double taxation. Right. And cigar smokers, triple taxation, not a problem. So that's why we're in the positions that we're in. Exit one off the every major 
highway, uh, still trying to make a political statement uh, to Massachusetts and saying, listen, this is what we did and this is why we did it. Uh, yes, I am trying to change the world and uh, not getting there, but I'm going to continue to fight. Everybody's got to continue to fight. And if we all fight together, believe me, it'll be loud and clear. I did. I accomplished a lot by myself, but can you imagine with everybody else? And that means the consumer. And Cigar Rights of America is mm -hmm. the only place for us to go right now as consumers. Go there. You're talking $35. Yeah. Nothing. You know, a couple of good cigars is, is mm -hmm. all is all the cost. And you know what? As you said, they're giving you a couple of good cigars just for right. joining. Right. So everybody, it, it, it's it's a necessity. It's a demand. You have to do it. You're part of the problem if you're not part of the solution, Absolutely. which is jo well, joining. And, and Dave, one of the things I love that you brought from the uh, Boston in Massachusetts area is your accent. So don't ever <laughs> change. Keep that accent. Uh -huh. It's great. It's it's comforting to me to listen to your show when I travel and to hear people speak with the accent because I feel like I'm at home. Home, so I thought something sounded funny. Actually. Yeah, keep that. Keep that. <laughs> to me, it sounds like home, right? <laughs> so that's awesome, Dave. Thank, thank you, you so much yeah. for coming on our show. We're definitely gonna have you back. We only scratched the surface of things we want to oh, uh, talk yeah, about you yeah. with. Yeah. With it, it was my pleasure and honor. Thank you for having me on your anniversary uh, and for the support of the uh, Cigar Rights of America. It's an honor to do it. Happy to do it. Uh, Continued success. Keep up the good work. And thanks, congratulations Dave. on your 30 years, by the way. Yeah, to congratulations to, yep. to you, too. Yep. Thank you. Thank All right. You. Thanks, Dave. Take care, Dave. All right. Bye-bye. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and uh, we're going to bring on the, the guys from uh, Mr. J's Havana Smoke Shop, yep. Mr. Yep. Paul Joyle and uh, Mark Field. We're going to adjust the set a little bit. We, yep. wanna, we definitely want to have everyone on camera. Yep. So okay. uh, it's going to be a, a little bit of a break while I just get the set uh, you know, going here. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 